One of the most widely distributed large mammals in North America, white-tailed deer are a common sight in the Twin Cities area. Seeing wildlife in your neighborhood is exciting, but overpopulation of deer can negatively impact the health of the deer herd, public safety, and vegetation. White-tailed deer give a great boost to the economy, stimulating a lot of spending. So where is the balance? Join us today as we discuss the history of Minnesota's deer herd, their impact on biodiversity, and the challenges involved with keeping a balance. Welcome to The Wandering Naturalist, a Three Rivers Park District podcast. I'm Angela, a wildlife biologist at Three Rivers Park District. And I'm Brandon, an interpretive naturalist for Three Rivers Park District. Three Rivers Park District manages over 27,000 acres of parklands in suburban Hennepin County and surrounding areas. Join us as we wander from park to park and discuss the stories of the past, the nature in our present, and how these have shaped our parks. Come explore with us, The Wandering Naturalist. All right, so there is a lot to cover on this topic. So many things we could touch on, and really it can turn into a debate when it comes to deer. Yeah, I think there's a lot of emotion when it comes to deer. I think that uh, Bambi has a large part I to play. I loved Bambi. Yeah, um, I, I liked it as a kid. Now I ha- yeah. I don't know. It's I like other Disney movies better, to be honest. But, you know, I think it is one of the most successful conservation movies ever made. How so? Well, there's this whole thing called Bambi Syndrome, where people think that every deer they see is Bambi, and so they want to protect it. They connect. They connect with it. They connect with it. And that's not necessarily a bad thing, but I think it does add a lot more emotions into uh, deer Mm -hmm. and their populations and managing uh, and finding the balance for deer populations. We were saying an interesting fact in the Disney world of movies that when you think about villains in Disney movies, you had an interesting tidbit that I didn't even realize. Yes. So I've been told this, and um, the only human villain who has ever killed anybody was the hunter and Bambi. Wow. Um, There's been other deaths in Disney movies. Well, uh, Scar killed Mufasa. Yeah, that was devastating. I know. I still cry about that. Mm -hmm. And just wait till the live action. Mm -hmm. I don't know. We'll see. But um, as far as I know, uh, the hunter and Bambi was the only human villain that that killed somebody in Disney. So that's so. had a large impact on people that have watched that movie and and connect, like you said, to Bambi. Oh, it's a very, very sad scene. And part of the reason I think it was so sad is because at the time that Bambi came out, deer populations were incredibly small. People all over were worried about them. Um, now deer populations are much, much higher. And so I think a Bambi movie might be a little bit different nowadays. Yeah, deer are actually one of the largest conservation success stories Mm -hmm. because like you mentioned they had they had dwindling numbers so where we're at now that's not the case no i mean deer are even in places that historically they they never used to be and so you know there's all of this stuff that comes into it um there's a lot of emotion that comes into it uh and there's just things that people enjoy. People enjoy feeding them because they can Bird see the feeders. deer. Absolutely. Who doesn't like seeing a deer or walk by when you're on a hike? I just, this morning I was driving to work and I saw a deer walking right up the driveway to Eastman Nature Center. And she kind of looked at me and was like, get out of the road. I'm walking here. <laughs> um, but yeah, they, they, there's something about them. Like, even I have memories of like out doing vegetation surveys for the park district. And sometimes, depending on the year, you'll get a doe that kind of circles you and she isn't happy about you being there so she'll do like the The stomping stomping, and the like kind of like grunting noise oh yeah i've heard that camping at night and i know what it is and it still creeps me out yeah it is a creepy noise it's the the snorting and the stomping and so you know there's there's all these connections that we have to deer yeah for me i always think back to my childhood when trying to you know connect with things and Deer was one of them, and it was in the sense of my grandpa was a deer hunter, Mm -hmm. and so we all kind of grew up probably with at least someone in our family that hunted, and the venison, like deer jerky, summer sausage stuff that he would have in the fridge, I mean, that stuff was like gold, and it gobbled up very quickly. Yeah, I didn't grow up with it because I grew up in South Florida, Florida, so we didn't know any deer hunters, but uh, I mean, they hunt deer down there, but not where I I grew up, Um, but I've had it. Since I moved to Minnesota, and it's it's amazing. It is so good. Um, I I really enjoy it. Do you hunt at all, or have you hunted? I do not hunt. Um, at some point, I would like to solely because 
I have been telling people for years about the benefits of hunting deer for management purposes, and I feel like if I'm going to tell people that it's a benefit, you have to participate. I should experience it at least once, so I have a more realistic uh, view of what it's actually like. And so my goal is to someday do that. But me gonna... too. Yeah, we should make sure keep on each other to make we sure this do it bucket together. list. Yeah, make sure this bucket list thing happens. I've always so I did an internship at the DNR, yeah, um, which was involved with uh, farmland, wildlife, including deer. So I got to work on a lot of deer projects, and that was a really eye-opening experience to deal with it from that perspective. Um, but also it was more of um, research. So mm -hmm. really tracking the deer population in different methods. And I got to participate in monitoring for um, disease as well, CWD testing, chronic, chronic wasting, wasting disease. disease. And so I think really through that interacting with the hunters and um, handling 300 dead deer in a weekend. Mm -hmm. Yep. I feel like it just really gave me a different perspective from being that child that grew up watching Bambi to now to this extreme. Well, and I've never actually hunted, but I have helped with uh, controlled hunts to manage populations. So I used to work for Woodlake Nature Center in Richfield, Minnesota, and they only have about 150 acres. And so they, the staff there does controlled hunts mm. to reduce the deer population. And so my job was to sit in the van at night at one of the entrances to the park to make sure that nobody walked in during the hunt. Yeah, keep the park um, closed. Exactly. And so, you know, I've been sitting there for about four hours in this dark, cold van. And I had somebody come up on top of my window and he's like, you're really keeping my wife out, man. What are you doing sitting here? <laughs> I'm like, I'm trying to make sure nobody walks in the park. And I was in a park, you know, vehicle, but I understand. Dude um, in a van is creepy. And then because I was the new seasonal naturalist, even though uh, the, the permanent naturalist got to do the actual hunting, I was the one who got to do all the cleaning. And I had ah. never cleaned deer before. I, yeah. Yeah, I had like eight deer that I had to gut in one night. It was the first time I ever did it. That was, I do not like the insides of animals anyway. Uh, so that I was not my favorite really experience. Do. But uh, it was it was fascinating. And then all of the meat was donated to a food shelf yeah. uh, for, for people who don't have food. So that was, mm -hmm. that was really good. Um, but I think we should kind of address the fact that this podcast, we're both come from a biology right. background. We both work for parks where balance is important. Um, so we are pro hunting when it comes to managing for wildlife exactly. and making uh, sure that the, there's a balance between the needs of nature and the needs of people. Um, and I think for both of us, we think about hunting as managing for the population of deer, not as managing for any individuals. And I think that can be difficult because I know, um, you know, I personally get attached to animals. At Eastman Nature Center, for almost eight years, we had a deer came up that we called Nosy. Yeah, you know, that was the deer that was like missing a nose? She had like a, yeah, she, like her, there was some kind of birth defect. So the top of her nose was weird. And so we could really identify her. And, you know, you're not supposed to name animals and, right, and all of that. Rule. And we know this uh, intellectually, but emotionally as a human, that's really hard. And so we grew pretty attached to Nosy. And every year she would bring up her two fawns and she always managed to raise both of them. And she taught them how to eat at our bird feeders. And then um, she usually ended up adopting a fawn like halfway through winter hmm. every year too. But in one of the deer hunts, she ended up uh, being taken by a hunter and we were all pretty sad and disappointed because we'd really grown to like Nosy. Um, but the next winter, another uh, deer came up and started bringing her fawns up there. And so in the end, it might not be best for any single individual deer, but it's really better for the species because now this younger uh, deer had a chance to bring her fawns up. Uh, we got more genetic diversity because of that in our deer population. And it really does help keep them healthier overall. So we're going to kind of talk about why deer management is so important for our parks for deer and just for our parks in general. Yeah, a lot to do with uh, native vegetation. Uh, there's a lot of other issue and impacts that overpopulation of deer or any animal or wildlife can have on the system. So really it is about that balance. So why you, you might feel a personal connection because of Bambi or the deer in your backyard. I think it's just important to share this knowledge and perspective so that everyone, even if you're not a hunter yourself, that's fine, um, but just kind of really shedding some more light on the topic altogether. And I think... Uh if you are opposed to hunting, that's okay. Yeah, that absolutely. Is, uh, that is your viewpoint, and we definitely respect that. If you're listening to the podcast, I just ask you to listen with an open mind, and then yeah, if afterwards you still disagree with us, send us an email. There's going to be a lot to talk about it. Yeah, there's going to be some interesting stuff on here. It's not all about hunting. So that brings up what we're going to talk about in today's podcast. For the sake of time, 
this is there's a lot of stuff that you could touch on with deer. So today we're going to talk a bit about basic deer biology, their life cycle, habitat, food sources. And then we have some fantastic guests from Natural Resource Management visiting today to share information on deer population management. And then lastly, we will be joined by two hunters who are also park staff who participate in our own park hunts. So just kind of shedding a little bit more light um, from that perspective. So, Angela, I was hoping uh, you could maybe uh, help start off our discussion about them with a little bit of the history of deer, because we talked about how Bambi occurred in the time mm-hmm. when, you know, the deer population was really small. Um, what led up to that? How have deer been important in the history of Minnesota as opposed to how they are now? Yeah, so there there is some history behind white-tailed deer here in Minnesota. Um, they've been a part of the Minnesota's woods for many centuries. Uh, Native Indians depended on them as a food source, clothing, shelter, and goods for trading especially. And at the time of European settlement, deer existed throughout the wooded river valleys and woodlands of central and southern Minnesota. So now you know... So where are deer now? They are really adapted to edge habitat where mm-hmm. you've got uh, kind of the transition between prairie open and, and forest, wooded. open areas, open meadows. And so when you have thick, thick forests like we had pre-European settlement, that's not great habitat. And so you found them then in the parts of Minnesota that had the more open habitat right. along with the wooded habitat that they really needed. Yeah, and then there's another step that kind of happened. So with the northern forest, we had a lot of clear cutting going for timber through harvest through logging. Did you know that we logged so much white and red pine, you could stack all of the pine harvested just in northern Minnesota, the board feet, and it would go to the moon and back from Minnesota? Holy cow. No, I did not. Know yeah. That. So, I mean, the logging was huge in Minnesota. It was a yeah. giant industry. It's where most of the houses and the prairies were built from. Uh, very important, but it, it caused a lot of logging, which was detrimental to the animals that lived up there. But for the deer... They expanded. Yeah. Because it was perfect habitat then. All these young plants coming up was perfect food source for it. So, yeah, you kind of have this weird, like, pure European, and then we came in, and then they moved further north. But then there was an increase in land being converted to farming. So this decreased the habitat quality in many areas, along with before 1887. So deer hunting was unregulated throughout the state at that time. Mm Mm-hmm. It didn't that that severely reduced deer populations, right. but also elk, caribou, and moose, and that's the reason why caribou are more or less extirpated, removed mm-hmm. from the state, and elk have had to be reintroduced, and they're only in very small sections of the state. Um, there's some historical story, uh, oral histories, around Eastman Nature Center of people finding elk antlers that have been cached. So s- some. Oral Crazy. history evidence of elk maybe being in that region, you, mm-hmm. you wouldn't find them there nowadays no because way. they were hunted out just like the deer were. Yeah, so by the 1800s, deer were rare in many parts of Minnesota. Uh, hunting licenses weren't until the 1900s. So just to give you perspective, I mean, it was kind of a free-for-all. Um, so then with the urban sprawl, uh, the unregulated hunting, deer plummeted. And it's not like people went out and hunted deer just to, for sports and for fun back then. They were hunting deer for food and for trade. The fur was very valuable as a trade source. So it was really uh, a job. Yeah. Well, until the European settlers come, and then I think it changed a bit there. I think some of it was just for A little bit, but I think the there was, uh, like, I know most of elk and caribou and whatnot, it was to feed the loggers mm-hmm. because there Influx became of such population. a big European population in that area, and there was just too many people eating for the amount of deer and elk and caribou that were present. And so feeding them really took a toll, is why there was so much hunting and took a toll on the, the population of all of them. Right. And so then by the 1970s, the DNR was concerned for the dwindling deer population. So they there was a year where they canceled deer hunting completely, and that was 1971. So this allowed them to come up with a fix to help regulate. Um, they began issuing buck and doe licenses and a practice that continues today. Well, and I think it's become really ingrained. You go after the bucks. Because that's for deer conservation. And, you know, you get the nice trophy, but it's also become a huge part of uh, hunting ethics. You go for the bucks, not the doe. And so nowadays, even if we want people to go for does to help with population control of deer, it's still so ingrained. Oh, I don't want to shoot a doe. That's a doe. I got to go after the buck because that's more Mm -hmm. responsible. Yeah, and the doe Um, is actually where you're going to get the better population control. But in the 1970s, you didn't want that. You wanted the population Mm -hmm. to go because, I mean, the deer population really was at a critical level. Yeah, so it's definitely shown how there's been a flux. Mm -hmm. Um, And so there is... I think when people start talking about deer, it's important to know about that history behind it all. So managing Minnesota's deer herd is a continual process. 
and the many variables that affect the herd throughout the year make the task very difficult. But the primary goal to manage deer populations is at a local level with designated permit areas. So that's why the state is broken into permit areas, because it it varies very much from each area how many permits they're going to issue, and it's all very regulated. We even look at our our parks in the park district, the amount of deer we can have at... um Elm Creek Park Reserve and how we can manage that deer is going to be very different than in Highland Park Reserve in Bloomington. So you have to look at that local level to be effective at it. Right. Just to get into some basic biology, again, we are just touching very quickly on some information on deal, but the one thing I feel like we have to bring up is how they get their name, white-tailed deer, which is from their bright white underside of their tail, which they use as flagging in the presence of danger. So that's one thing I think everyone can relate to when they've spotted a deer, is getting that tail up and the white flag and then it bouncing away. What always makes me laugh about that is you can tell that when they do the flag is a a learned process. Because when a deer with her fawns come up in the winter and in the early spring, if somebody walks down the trail, the female just kind of calmly walks away with her tail down and the young are just bounding away, their tails right up. And, you know, it's the definitely uh, over time they learn, oh, maybe that isn't a danger. Maybe I should keep my tail down. Right. It's one of those things that I think is really fun to still see. It never, never gets old. Uh, Males and females can be distinguished apart because males, bucks, have antlers after their first year and females, does, do not. Though there are occasional exceptions I just learned, which I think is funny. It's it's very, very rare, but I know we had a, yes. a doe taken in Elm Creek Park Reserve that had antlers. There's always exceptions to nature. Yeah, she it's kind of... She will always throw us curveballs. Kind of interesting. Very rare, but still cool. And again, I could we could probably do a whole podcast on antlers because they're really fascinating. But one of the interesting things here is that the antler is the fastest growing organ regeneration in the animal family and it can grow several centimeters per day which again you can read different inches yeah you you can read conflicting things but i would say a really safe thing is half an inch to three-fourths of an inch a day is, okay. is probably the average growth which is just crazy to think of something growing that fast yeah well and the fact that i mean they keep it until late winter and then the males drop their antlers and then by spring they're already growing them again Right. And it's important. You'll hear, sometimes I'll hear people talk about deers having horns. Horns and antlers are very different. Horns are made of the same material as your fingernails. Right. And they don't fall off. And they don't fall. They're continually growing. Correct. So those are the big difference. And antlers are bone and they do fall off. Exactly. Perfect way you can you can surprise and fascinate your next party guest with why horns and antlers are different. <laughs> so one other thing we should touch on with deer is their diet, because we're going to talk about vegetation and how they can be very detrimental to native uh, trees and plants. They are tremendous opportunistics, eating well over 700 different species of plants. That's amazing. 700 species? Yep, that's, that's what I And are they I just read. eating the leaves or are they eating... What are they eating from the plants? Um, they can eat as many foods such as acorns, corn, soybeans, mushrooms, grasses, tree leaves, buds, twigs and bark, grapes, apples, assorted shrubs. I mean, really, we're talking a lot. Can, can I share something that might make people really sad about deer? <laughs> sure, yeah. All right. So this is, again, very rare, but it's almost impossible to find true herbivores in nature because everything's opportunistic and there are videos of deer finding baby birds in nests and eating the baby birds. I have heard that too. Because it's an easy protein source and there's also reports of deer eating fish kills in the spring. Because again, it's easy protein yeah, right and it there. can help them grow. So again, rare, they're mostly herbivores, but they'll do it. And then in the winter, they change their diet. They don't eat leaves because leaves aren't around mm-hmm. or fruit. They're eating twigs, but they're eating the twigs to get the buds, the baby leaves off the plants, which are kind of small little packets of energy that they can eat. And it's important to note that a lot of people like to feed deer during the winter because they feel yeah. bad for them. It's like, oh, they're right. just eating twigs. It's awful. But if you start feeding deer corn in the winter, you can actually um, cause them to starve to death. Right. Because they don't actually digest it. It's the bacteria in their gut that mm-hmm. digests corn. And they lose that bacteria in the fall as they switch over to bacteria that can digest the twigs and the buds. And so if you just start feeding them corn in, you know, December, January, February, they're going to be eating all that corn, but they can't digest it. Right. And then they, um, it can cause them to starve to death mm-hmm. where they would have been better off just eating twigs, which is what they're adapted to eating in the winter. Yeah. So this brings up a really interesting thing about deer. White-tailed deer are ruminants. 
What is a ruminant? And this is our nature word of the podcast. Oh, I was hoping it was. (laughs) Uh, So they consume at a high rate and retreat into safer cover to finish digesting because of being ruminants. And so ruminants are, I will give you the definition here, are um, they're usually they're in even toed ungulates that chew the cud regurgitated from its rumen. Hence, you can get some connection there. And rumen just means throat. The ruminants are comprised of like cattle, sheep, antelopes, deer, giraffes, and and some others. So then there are animals then that chew the cud. Yes. That have like two toes or four toes. You've heard the, you know, chew your, chew the cud. Okay. That's, that's where this comes from. So they eat and they can fill their stomach in about one to two hours and then they go and sit down. Because it's dangerous when you're filling your stomach because a predator might see you. So they go into safety, into hiding and they're going to lay down and they, they just regurgitate their food and rechew it to go back in and be digested. And this is because they have a four-chambered stomach. It's the rumen and then the reticulum, the omassum, and the abomassum. Yeah. That's a lot That's a little too many nature words. words, so we're just going to stick to this <laughs> ruminant. But you can use this ruminant word. You could, you know, if someone says chewing the cud, you can toss out that ruminant word and know what it means. And if you've ever seen a cow just chewing and chewing and chewing, Cows it's doing have the it same too. thing. Yep. Absolutely. And it allows them to eat digest their food in safety and they'll chew the cud like three or four times and each time it goes to a different chamber in their stomach where different bacteria can help digest it. So the bacteria digests it, they chew it to break it down more, they swallow it, the bacteria digests it more and that's how they get enough nutrients from a plant-based diet because it's really hard to get nutrients because plants have cellulose which is hard to digest and you bacteria and so for deer they're chewing the cud other animals have other strategies rabbits and beavers eat their poop the first time to help (laughs) digest it again i personally like chewing the cud better i think yeah i think uh, that's a better use of it yep so now you can use that word uh, your nature word of the day so and it does have a latin uh the rumen rumen is throat rumen is chewing over again um, so it has that Latin base again. So again, we have a lot of information to cover, but I think we're going to cover these well with our next guest to talk about deer reproduction, which goes into why we have to manage their, they're very good at reproducing. Just two deer can produce a herd of up to 35 deer in just seven years. That's amazing. Yes. Well, and if you have a good winter, I suppose it's because each doe can have twins. On, or uh, even, like, yeah, or, or more. even more, mm-hmm. but they rarely have less than twins. And, um, If you have not very severe winters, which we have a lot of now with climate change, if you don't have predators attacking you, if you have plenty of food, which we have plenty of with all of our farm fields and how we've changed the habitat to more of that edge habitat, it's really ideal conditions. And there are no predators because we've hunted the predators out of this area. You know, we've gotten rid of the wolves and the mountain lions and the other things that might eat a deer successfully. So it's made ideal conditions for them to start overpopulating. And that's part of where this management comes in is us taking care of a mess that we created. Exactly. And so now that we've covered some of the deer basics, why are we talking about them in a balance? Why are they an issue? How? We all love Bambi. Um, So how can we be talking about them in, you know, how they have to be managed and controlled? Some claim they are a larger issue than climate change. Really? Yeah, so the rebound of white-tailed deer population over 20 million roam the U.S. today is viewed as one of the nation's greatest conservation success stories, as we mentioned. But there is a dark side to this success. Too many deer can cause problems from humans, other wildlife, and even for the deer themselves. And I kind of wanted to end it before we get into our guest with an Aldo Leopold quote, which I found really interesting. I now suspect that just as a deer herd lives in mortal fear of its wolves, so does a mountain live in mortal fear of its deer. And I think this really touches that even back when Aldo was making observations, he was thinking of this too, of how deer population was growing and how it could be problematic. I think he realized that as, because he was a, a very famous hunter, a very famous naturalist, and it was that experience being out there that allowed him to see these things. And he talks a lot you know, as part of that same chapter with that quote is thinking like a mountain. And a mountain doesn't think about individuals. A mountain doesn't think about a year from now or two years from now. A mountain thinks long term and it thinks about everything that's on it. And I think that thinking like a mountain leads us to deer management. I think I want to go back to that climate change too. And some people thinking deer are a bigger threat than climate change. I would think that, you know, if we're thinking like a mountain like Aldo Leopold, um, 
in a lot of ways, overpopulation of deer is part of the symptoms of climate change, and it's part of the symptoms of having such a huge human population. Right. We're at the point where we have agree. over 7 billion people on the world. It's growing and growing and growing, which means we're creating more and more edge habitat as we go out to fill it. And so these deer are symptoms of that. So I don't know if I'd say it's a bigger threat than climate change. It's hand in hand. It's hand in hand. I think that they help each other have impacts, and I think human overpopulation helps with that too. Right. So, and when we have our guests, we're going to talk a little bit more about some of these issues, um, you know, whether it's crop damage, which is, it's got a money value behind it, or that it's deer collision with vehicles. And again, we have some t- statistics that we can share with that too when we have our guest, um, or disease. These are all things that have become issues because of overpopulation of deer. So again, this was a lot of information. We hope you feel now uh, like you have a better understanding of why this is a hot button topic and you know more complicated than just you like Bambi. Um, so we're going to bring in our first guest, staff from Natural Resource Management, Stephen and Sean, and they're representing both forestry and wildlife because again, it's all about balance. Exactly. And I'm excited to hear from them how we balance the population of deer so that the negative impacts of deer don't overshadow the positive impacts. Right, and we can't manage for trees and forest restoration unless we're managing for the deer as well. So thank you for listening. I hope you enjoy our next episode as well. In the meantime, if you have questions or comments for us, if you have ideas for topics you want us to talk about, uh, you can go ahead and email us at wanderingnaturalist at threeriversparks.org.